The food then enters the stomach through a muscle called the cardiac sphincter. Now let's pause there. The stomach is a pouch-like structure. So both of its openings are usually regulated by two muscles. So at that opening, we have the cardiac sphincter. So the cardiac sphincter relaxes to allow food to pass from the esophagus into the stomach and then closes up to prevent food from going back into the esophagus. Now on the other end, we have the pyloric sphincter. When digestion is complete in the stomach, the pyloric sphincter relaxes to allow food into the first part of the small intestine and that is the duodenum. Once food is in the stomach, it stimulates the stomach walls to secrete gastric hormone. Now, gastric hormone then stimulates the gastric glands that are found in the stomach wall to secrete gastric juice. So essentially, you're having a hormone that is giving a signal to the stomach walls like, okay, it's now time, the food is here, secrete gastric juice, and the stomach does so. Now, within the gastric juice, you're going to have a mixture containing, number one, hydrochloric acid, and two enzymes enzyme pepsin and enzyme renin. Now what is the function of hydrochloric acid? Number one, the hydrochloric acid in our stomach is strongly acidic. It has a pH of two. So it kills a lot of the bacteria that are present in our food. Now another function of the hydrochloric acid is that it activates pepsin and renin. Now in the gastric juice, as mentioned before, we have two enzymes, pepsin and renin. But these enzymes are usually secreted in an inactive form. Any, they are not active at that point on secretion. And the reason for this is because these enzymes work on proteins. They break down proteins. So they are not activated unless food is present and therefore hydrochloric acid is also present. And the reason for this is because when active, they can digest proteins. Now, whether food is there or not, they will start on whatever is made of proteins. And unfortunately, or our stomach walls are made of proteins, so they can act on the stomach wall, digesting the stomach wall itself in the absence of food. Now you can imagine how disastrous this can be. So in order to prevent this, they are usually secreted in an inactive form. In the presence of hydrochloric acid, they are now activated. Now the inactive forms of these two enzymes are pepsinogen and the other one, proreneum. So these are then activated to the active forms, pepsin and renin. Now the third function of hydrochloric acid is that it provides a suitable medium for the functioning of the enzymes. Now when it comes to enzymes, enzymes are particular to their pH. Some prefer an acidic pH, such as in this case, others prefer a basic pH, most usually prefer a neutral pH. Now if you would like to learn more about this, be sure to check out my video on enzyme reactions where I make all of these clear. Now in the case of pepsin and renin, these require an acidic pH in order to function. So hydrochloric acid provides this. What are the functions of these two enzymes? So pepsin breaks down proteins to peptides, renin breaks down carcinogen to casein. Now these are proteins, carcinogen is found in milk. Now we also have a third component and that is mucus. We have a lot of mucus in our stomach. The mucus coats the stomach walls. It surrounds the stomach walls in a thick layer. Now the mucus is secreted by specialized cells called goblet cells. So what is the function of the mucus? Number one is that the mucus protects the stomach walls from the corrosion of hydrochloric acid. So as mentioned before, hydrochloric acid is a very strong acid. And as you can imagine, it can eat away at the stomach wall over time. So in order to prevent this, we have a thick layer of mucus protecting it. And the other function of mucus is that it protects the stomach wall from auto-digestion by the protein digesting enzymes. So it protects the stomach walls from being digested by pepsin and renin. Are we clear? One other fascinating thing about the stomach is that the stomach walls are made of muscles that can contract and relax. Now by doing so, they actually mix the contents of the stomach thoroughly. Now this is known as churning, this movement of the muscles. It results in a mixture that is known as chine. So whatever leaves the stomach at this point is what is known as chine. Now the chine is going to be acidic. So it passes out of the stomach through the pyloric sphincter and into the first part of the small intestine. And that is the duodenum. 
Now the duodenum receives secretions from two organs, the liver and the pancreas. But let's start with the liver. Within the liver, you have a small structure known as the gallbladder. In the gallbladder is where bile juice is stored. Now bile juice is secreted to the duodenum. It passes through the bile duct into the duodenum. Now within the bile juice, you have two salts. Salt number one, sodium glycocholate. Salt number two, sodium torocholate. Now these two salts are very, very important. This is because they are involved in a process known as emulsification. Now emulsification sounds like a complicated term, but essentially it's a process whereby fats are broken down into all small droplets. You know, fats and oils are broken down into small droplets. Now, in case you're wondering why, why are we doing this? Remember, when enzymes need to act on substances, the substances have to be in small forms so that we can have efficient chemical digestion. So essentially emulsification is simply breaking down the fats and the lipids into small droplets in preparation for enzyme action. That will take place in the duodenum. Now, what about the pancreas? So the pancreas releases pancreatic juice. Now, pancreatic juice then travels through the pancreatic duct into the duodenum. What are the contents of the pancreatic duct, you ask? Number one is that we have enzymes, of course. In fact, we have a variety of enzymes. We also have a chemical compound called sodium hydrogen carbonate. You might have heard of this in chemistry, acids and bases. Now, sodium hydrogen carbonate has two functions. Number one is that it neutralizes the chyme. Remember the chyme that just came from the stomach is acidic because it has traces of acids on it. So the sodium hydrogen carbonate neutralizes the acidic chyme. And number two is that it provides an alkaline pH for the functioning of the enzymes. Now the enzymes in the duodenum actually prefer an alkaline pH. So this is where the sodium hydrogen carbonate comes in. It provides an alkaline pH for the optimal functioning of these enzymes. Enough. What are the enzymes? Tell me already. Okay. So the enzymes are as follows. Number one, we have pancreatic amylase. Now remember what I told you about amylase? This is an enzyme that breaks down starch to maltose. Moving on, pancreatic lipase breaks down lipids to fatty acids and glycerol. And the last one, trypsin. Now, trypsin is an enzyme that breaks down proteins. Now, just like with pepsin and renin, this enzyme is produced in an inactive form, and that is trypsinogen for the same reason. Now, this is activated and then it acts on proteins. Now, once the food leaves the duodenum, it then moves into the second part of the small intestine, and that is the ilia. Now, in case you're wondering, how does food move about? Peristalsis. We have muscles all along the alimentary canal that contract and relax to push food along. Now, in the ileum, this is where digestion becomes complete. So at this point, we're expecting that if we have carbohydrates, they're supposed to be in the simplest form. Same goes for proteins and same goes for lipids. Now there are secretory cells in the ileum that secrete intestinal juice. This is also known as Saccus entericus. Now Saccus entericus contains the following enzymes. We have number one, maltase. Maltase, of course, breaks down maltose to glucose. We also have sucrase. Sucrase breaks down sucrose to form glucose and fructose. We have lactase, it breaks down lactose, it breaks down lactose to form glucose and galactose. We also have lipase, it breaks down lipids to fatty acids and glycerol. And last one, peptidase, it breaks down any peptides to amino acids. And at this point, digestion is now complete. Now the ileum has several adaptations that ensures that efficient digestion and absorption of food substances takes place. So let's go through some of these adaptations. Number one, you have presence of villi and microvilli. What are villi? Villi are tiny finger-like projections that are found on the surface of the small intestine. The function of the villi and also the microvilli is simply to increase the surface area for maximum absorption or for efficient absorption of food substances. Remember, the larger the surface area, the faster the rate of a reaction. So this makes the process of absorption of food substances more efficient. Now, another thing about uh, the small intestine is that 
you'll notice it's very long quite long again this adaptation has to do with surface area it increases the surface area for efficient absorption of food substances it's highly coiled now a lot of students tend to think that the reason why the ileum is highly coiled is so as to increase the surface area wrong the reason why it's coiled is so as to slow down the movement of foods therefore providing more time for efficient digestion and absorption remember if you're moving across a curved surface it's going to take time reducing the speed therefore it means that digestion as well as absorption is going to be efficient Another adaptation of the ileum is that it's highly vascularized. It has a dense network of capillaries, so many capillaries surrounding it. And the reason why there are these capillaries is so as to maintain a steep concentration gradient for efficient absorption and diffusion of food substances. Next one, or oh, is it last one? Huh. It has the lactyl. Now the lactyl absorbs fatty acids and glycerol so that they can then be transported to the lymphatic system and finally into the blood stream. At this point, absorption takes place. You are going to have food substances moving into the surrounding blood vessels so that they can be transported all over the body for assimilation for use by the various cells. Whatever remains at this point is then going to move to the large intestine. The large intestine is also referred to as the colon. Now this is long and wide to facilitate absorption of water and mineral salts. Now the large intestine also contains a lot of bacteria, symbiotic bacteria that manufacture vitamin K. Some of this vitamin K of course is used by the bacteria themselves, but most of it is actually absorbed by the host, in this case the humans. The food then passes into the rectum, which is the temporary storage area for the feces, and then out into the anus. And that brings us to the end of this jam-packed lesson. I hope you've enjoyed it and learned a lot from it. See you next time.